Um, so we have a fantastic fireside chat, and so meet Jessica Chai, uh, who is a contributor and editor for, uh, sorry, Chia for um, uh, Allure, and she's going to be talking to the fantastic Daisy Algor Dominguez. All right, let it, um, I'm leaving the mic to you then, Jessica. Thank you so much. Um, Daisy, I'm so excited to be in conversation with you today. Um, so Daisy is the Chief People Officer at VICE. And um, Daisy, if you just want to kick it off with telling us what it is exactly that you do for those of us who are intelligent to know what a Chief People Officer is. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Jessica. So great to uh, see you and uh, thrilled to be here with everyone today. Um, yes, I've got this big title that doesn't seem to say much. Um, I am the Chief People Officer at Vice Media Group. That means that I'm responsible for what um, in most organizations is called uh, human resources, HR. Uh, my team is responsible for the entire employee life cycle from recruitment to retention to development. We find people, we keep them, and we grow them. Um, I'm also our de facto chief diversity officer, um, and I'm responsible for diversity and inclusion efforts, and also our chief corporate responsibility officer, which means that I'm responsible for all of our social impact work. Um, but because that's a lot of titles, I just tell everyone that I'm chief people officer. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you not hear me? Oh. Okay, sorry. I didn't realize that I couldn't mute and unmute. So I muted to like just ambient noise. And then it was like, you cannot unmute yourself. Okay, lesson learned. Um, that's incredible. I was gonna say that I'm so impressed because I've worked at many organizations where um, diversity and inclusion was seen as a black and white issue. And um, we have, you know, obviously we have many uh, big Afro-Latino presence, um, but it, it's, there's so many shades in between. And so I love that you are, you know, someone who can speak to that and, and look at the nuances of, of what diversity inclusion really is. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. I think we've frozen here. Uh, okay. Sorry. That's probably me. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, how did I you think, I think hear your question? Um, so you want to know how I got to where I am? Um, yeah. So I, I always uh, thank you, Karina. Um, I have. I always start with the beginning, right? Um, I was born in New York City uh, to teenage parents. My father's Dominican. My mother's Puerto Rican. Um, and my paternal grandparents offered to raise me in the Dominican Republic. So I did the opposite migratory pattern. Mm -hmm. I was born in New York, raised in the Dominican Republic. I studied at an international school there. That's how I learned English. Um, and my family's focus was always that I would become a professional and I would come to America to study. Um, so when I was a junior in high school, I moved back to the US, this time to New Jersey. Uh, and I finished high school in New Jersey. And, uh, and then I went to undergrad. Um, but I always talk about that move to the United States because it was the beginning of a journey of identity formation for me. You know, I grew up being very much Dominican and Puerto Rican, you know, being working class, um, going to an international school. So, you know, mm -hmm. understanding and valuing the different class systems and, you know, and sort of economic systems that, that existed within those deviations, but sort of having one foot here and one foot there. And then I moved to the US and in the US, they put me in one place, right? They said, you're uh -huh. Hispanic. <laughs> that, yeah. is, that is what you yeah. are. And that definition of Hispanic was not as expansive as my definition of Hispanic, right? Um, uh -huh. it, you know, I had seen every, every, every color, every designation, every career. And in the US, my sense was, at least from my, my, my student peers, my, um, my, even some of my teachers, that there was this general sense that most Hispanics were either uneducated, all immigrants, um, you know, poor socioeconomic standing. And, and that box was something that you know, I've, I've struggled with for a long time. And it's one that I've constantly sought to redefine and reimagine for folks. Um, and then I went on to undergrad and I was, um, again, just a couple of years in the country when I was an undergrad. So I had that, again, that foot here, foot there. I was a bit of an international student because I was still understanding what it was like to be Latino within an American context. Mm -hmm. um, but, but also very much, you know, this brown girl that was trying to find her voice. And that was in a school that was less than 5% racially and ethnically diverse. Um, and so very early on, in my academic uh, career, 
gravitated and was pulled into communities of color in a really beautiful and warm way. And so all of my friends were the black and brown kids on campus because that's where we found home. Um, and that's where I, I, I did my real learning around racial dynamics in this country um, and started doing my own learning around racial dynamics in my own country. Um, and, you know, and from undergrad, I went on to graduate school. I got my master's in public administration. Um, I continued my interest in identity politics and I have a master's in public policy with a concentration on a multicultural education policy. So um, and then after grad school, I did a fellowship in public affairs, the Coral Fellows Program. And again, did that really out of, out of an interest and desire to understand what does policymaking look like? And you know, for the people around the table, they get to make all these decisions by which you and I live, right? Um, and at the end of that experience, realized that um, I didn't have any, any real work experience. I was, had been mostly academic and nonprofit, and I thought that I needed to understand what the for-profit world looked like. And I got a job at Moody's Investor Service uh, as a credit risk analyst. Wow. And ended up working there for 12 years. <laughs> and yeah, that was, that was a, a big chunk of my career. I was a credit risk analyst for six years, first domestically and then internationally. Uh, mm -hmm. When we expanded to Latin America, they were looking around to see who spoke Spanish. And here was this junior <laughs> analyst who spoke Spanish fluently um, and who was really able to navigate cultural divides in a way that was much more natural than for others. So where, where I was very junior and green, quite frankly, in those early stages and had so much to learn, I was also able to navigate spaces that my senior leaders um, couldn't. And that, right. that helped that helped sort of balance the divide. And it, and it also helped me find my voice, right? I, I talk, mm -hmm. I have a TED talk about finding my voice and, um, and inclusion. And it was really at Moody's where, where I realized after going through the space of being the only, right? And, yeah. and being the youngest and the only woman and the only Latinx and all of those pieces um, that can really, you know, sort of drive up the imposter syndrome sense and then push down our comfort and our confidence um, right. but I was I was able to to slowly and with the support of a lot of mentors and allies move move through that um, and so then I eventually managed our global corporate foundation and eventually became the first head of diversity and inclusion um, at, at Moody's investor service um, and that means that um, I'm sorry to answer Susanna's question about imposter syndrome um, that that's that nagging feeling uh, on the side of you every time that you are wondering, do I really belong here? Um, mm -hmm. Should I speak up? Will people listen to me? Do people really even care I'm in the room? <laughs> that's, that's the imposter syndrome that many of us carry. Um, and so it took me a long time to get over that. Um, but as I moved over my career, I, uh, as, as many of us do, found my voice, got a, got a bit stronger. Um, and then after Moody's, after 12 years there, um, decided that I had reached everything that I could within that, within that company and within that industry. And it was an industry that I loved um, and a people that I loved, um, but I wanted to do something else. And so I made a lateral move to Time Warner uh, in their executive search function. And I, I'm explicit about saying that because some of our moves are you know, lateral, some of our moves you know, are upward and they can take a lot of different shapes. Uh, but this was a lateral move um, and I was in their executive search function focusing on diversity sourcing. So that meant finding great talent like you, Jessica, into the organization and, um, and finding senior level roles for them. And it was, it was actually really, um, it was fun, it was enticing, but it wasn't the strategic and, and direct work that I wanted to do. Um, and so about two years after that, I had a great opportunity to move over to the Walt Disney Company and um, to relaunch the diversity and inclusion function for the Disney ABC television group. Uh, and that job was in LA. Uh, so at that point, my daughter was around four and my husband and I, you know, did what, what many Dominicans don't do in Puerto Rico is we, you know, I picked up my bag and I went all the way west. I went farther away yeah. from the island. Um, yes. And, um, and it was wonderful. And, and I loved my time at, at Disney. And, and within just a couple of months of being there, I also took over the talent acquisition function. So my, my role has always been one. I start a job and then I start expanding and adding mm -hmm. on to what I do. Um, and three years after that, I got um, the call and, and eventually the opportunity to join Google. Uh, and 
um, and Google created a job for me. It was a global diversity staffing role. Um, I was responsible for ensuring that we were bringing more black, Hispanic, and female software engineers to the organization and, uh, and expanding our, our strategy and our processes. Uh, yeah. And so I did that um, for two years. And uh, at that point, we, I was you know, two years longer than we ever expected to be on the West Coast and wanted to come and, and had a real deep need to come back to, um, uh, to the East Coast, closer to my family. Yeah. And so I had an opportunity to join Viacom uh, to relaunch their talent acquisition function with a lens on, again, inclusion. And I did that for a year. And after a reorg, I was without a role, but with an opportunity to take on a year um, and really figure out what my next steps were. And so it was a rocky start to that, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I spent the year traveling with my family, volunteering, um, just taking it easy for the first time in my life. Um, right, you've been working, working, working. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And then after that, um, I had an opportunity to decide what I wanted to do. And so I started a consulting uh, business uh, in workplace culture. I launched mm -hmm. it. I did that for a year. Um, and earlier this year, COVID hit. Um, and I had right around the time that COVID hit, I had Hint Hunter call me about a job at Vice Media Group. And I was really loving my consultancy, but kind of trying to figure out, well, this pandemic is really putting the future of work right in front of us. Right. So like, I think I want to be there, right? I think mm -hmm. I want to be somewhere where I can shape that and figure that out for an organization directly. Um, and it was the best thing I ever did. I joined in May um, mm -hmm. and I've never met my boss. I've never met <laughs> my team, um, but I think I'm doing a really good job and I've been here for six months now. So that's Absolutely. my story. No, that's incredible. And I think, I think the thing that we can't overlook here um, is that by being a part of so many different organizations, working in media, working in tech, you are changing so many different landscapes, right? Um, and, and that's an incredible opportunity. Um, I am so, so interested in how you studied public policy as well. I, I'm also part Puerto Rican and Puerto Rican, Mexican and Chinese. Um, mm -hmm. But we grew up very close to the Puerto Rican side of my family. We're actually California Puerto Ricans. <laughs> so we're the unusual ones who came to California and we've just lived here. But I think the being Puerto Rican and understanding public policy is so important because we're a weird legal entity, right? And so I, I love that you kind of were drawn to that because that's sort of been our strange history as, as part of this country, you know, so um, incredible. But um, jumping back into uh, the approved question set, what do you wish uh, someone had asked you, had told you at the beginning of your career, at the beginning of your journey? There's so much, um, but I, you know, I, I, I was really grateful to have had people that have said the things that I, I wish for everyone at the beginning of their career, which was that I mattered that that they valued me and that they wanted me to do well um so I'll, i have to say I, I credit some of my early managers and and you know and mentors in that um, but i really do wish that and and i and i say this often that instead of being asked to solve for diversity equity and inclusion that people had asked me what are the barriers that you that you face huh. what are the challenges to your success and how can yeah. i help you overcome them Definitely, definitely. And, and you spoke to the pandemic and having started a new job in the midst of it. Um, it are there new skills that you feel that you've strengthened through that, um, through leading through the pandemic or maybe joining a team through the midst of a pandemic? There's so much. I, I'll tell you that the, the first reaction that I had during the pandemic when everybody was sort of, you know, losing it, if you will, about like, toilet paper and fish and, you know, and, you know, my first reaction was like, you know, when you come from a, you know, a, a developing nation that has survived a brutal dictatorship um, that is not America, like, you can deal with anything. <laughs> I was like, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually, um, I have a stockpiles of beans and rice and anything that you can think of for any emergency. Yeah. My husband thinks that in, in, in the case of any emergency, he's like, you know, that I'm constantly planning for that. But for me, quite frankly, you know, I was like, my, my joke to him is like, but we're going to be okay. And those around us are going to be okay. We survived on beans and rice once. We're going to do it again. <laughs> and we're going to, and we're going to make it for the community, right? Because mm -hmm. we grew up in communities that took care of each other and that knew what, what scarcity was about and yeah. that knew, and that knew what unexpected challenges 
you know, could come from politics, from environmental disasters, all of that. Um, so that was my first reaction of like, oh, I'm built for this. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. I can, you know, I can handle this. Um, but frankly, I think for all of us, it's, it's, been, um, it's been a matter of honing, honing in on um, what we know works for people in terms of connection and in terms of building out um, who we are. Uh, I joined, like I said, during, during a pandemic during a, um, a financial crisis. So there's a health crisis, there's a financial crisis, and very shortly after me joining a racial crisis. Um, all mm -hmm. of those things happening yeah. all at once. Um, and, and again, none of these things, um, experiences that hadn't happened before, but all of a sudden as a leader, and especially as a people leader, having to not just do for me and my team, but for our entire organization, being able to reset and remind each other of, here are our values. Here's what we care about. Here's what we do. And here's how we're going to show up in a moment for all of us so that we show up in a way that feels authentic, that is consistent with our values, and that enables those who have not been seen before to be seen, those who are at risk of not being seen now to not fall into those traps, and those who have been comfortable all along to sit in the discomfort of understanding that their privilege has cost some of what we're facing right now. So it's, yeah. it's looking at all of those experiences. And, and a lot of it was work that I had done year over year that I had never been in a position to actually execute it this way. And a lot of it was also just, quite frankly, Jessica, just trying things every day. And, you know, and, you know, and, and speaking up when I felt like I needed to speak up, modeling it for our teams and making sure that um, we were not enabling any bad behavior that was going to cost any additional burdens on an employee population that was already facing, you know, just, you know, just increasingly heavy burdens day in and day out. Definitely. That's, that's huge. That's very important. And I love that you speak to the flexibility piece because that's huge. Um, how do you advocate for fellow Latinx employees within the workplace? Um, I, I know that Viacom has an incredibly strong ERG, so I, I don't know if you were a part of that, but I, I, as soon as I heard that, I was like, oh my gosh, it makes so much sense. Um, well, yes, I've, I've always advocated for Latinx and uh, employees everywhere I've worked. I was, I was the executive sponsor of the Latino ERG at Google. Um, I lead, actually, we call them community groups at Vice. Um, I, I'm the leader for our community groups at Vice for all of them. Um, and ERGs are employee resource groups um, and or affinity groups, or as we call them, community groups. So it's usually they follow within those terms. Um, and, um, and that's a way for me of being able to model to employees of what it, what it looks like and feels like to be your authentic self. Um, mm -hmm. I, I joke that between uh, September 15th and October 15th every year, I'm super Latina um, because I'm invited to go to every panel and speak up. Yeah. Um, but I've written about this and I say this all the time. You know, we, we, don't, we, don't just, uh, we don't just, you know, exist in this period of time during the year. We exist all year long and our gifts and our opportunities are there to be, you know, to be valued all year long. Um, and so the, the way that I, that I advocate for and support and, um, and engage with the Latino community is by mentoring, by, by doing this, by speaking yeah. in events like this, um, and, and by ensuring that, um, that we're amplifying our voice and, and that um, the silence of the Hispanic and, and Latinx community, which um, as, as, as numerous as we are, as powerful and beautiful as we are, um, continues to be something that we that we have an opportunity to really amplify. I think since 2000, we've been waiting for this wave of like, oh, you know, the, the Latino way, like the changes. And every decade we talk about it. And every decade I look around and go like, we've been here. Um, yeah. And our contributions are still not as valued as they should be. Um, and I'm a strong proponent of making sure that folks are aware of that and that, and that we continue to build really deep community with with other identity groups, with other community groups um, that 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 quite frankly are part of our broader humanity. Right, and, and I think one of the some one of the biggest things you can do is just say, "I'm Latina." That even that has huge weight as someone who is C level at a company that's absolutely incredible, um, because. I think there are so many of us throughout media and finance and all of these industries, but unless people are willing to say, yeah, my last name isn't, but I, I'm, you know, El Salvadorian. 
having that is so important. It's, it's a really big to step into our identity. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I've been warned we have two minutes. Um, but we have two more questions, so this is perfect. Um, first off, what challenges do you think confront uh, Latinx women in the United States today? I think primarily is, is uh, the very similar challenges to those that, that um, impact all women. Uh, I'll start with pay equity. We're at the lowest range uh, from a pay equity perspective um, and you know, earning 54 cents to the dollar for what white men uh, earn. Um, I think that visibility is another piece of being seen as the leaders that we can be um, and, and doing away with the traditional stereotypes that impact the Latina image. Um, and I, you know, and I think that economic empowerment, and I sit on the board of Planned Parenthood, um, as well as, you know, our, our, our reproductive rights, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's power, that's empowerment, um, and being able to speak to that uh, clearly and, and honestly, and have the access that we all deserve. Absolutely. And, and lastly, what is one piece of advice you would like to leave with the audience? Well, I've been hearing the advice so far, which has all been fantastic. Um, and you know, I'll add one piece of it. You know, when when you when you feel like you are being told that you need to fix yourself, be very clear of we can all grow and develop. There's always room for that, but you don't need to fix yourself. The system is broken. You're not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's beautiful. Thank you so much, Daisy. Thank you for your time, um, and we really appreciate everyone for popping in with questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Wonderful. Hi, Daisy. <laughs> so great to see you. And Jessica, thank you so much for moderating that fireside chat. Daisy is absolutely amazing, as all of you had ha have had an opportunity to hear. Again, my name is Natalie Madeira Cofield, and I am the founder and CEO of Walker's Legacy. Uh, we are super excited to have hosted today's Lat Latinx Women Entrepreneurship Summit. This is the first of many more initiatives and programs in this space to come. So just know that you should stay tuned and most importantly, stay connected to the work of Walker's Legacy. I wanna thank our mistress of ceremonies, Blanca Garcia, for serving not only as our MC today, uh, but most, most uh, importantly and primarily as a lead instructor for the Walker's Legacy Prospectus Program, where she is currently leading our first ever prospectus Latina cohort of nearly 30 amazing Latina women who are serving as entrepreneurs and are participating in her three month accelerator for which she serves as the leader. Um, I also want to thank all of the amazing speakers that we have had throughout today's uh, formidable program. Thank them for their time, thank them for their commitment, and thank them for their dedication. Um, and I will say lastly, thank them for their representation. As you just heard from Jessica, uh, sometimes people don't know what you are. Um, and that's, in, that's important in moments uh, to stand up and, and communicate your pride, your respect, and your appreciation for your heritage and for the community that you represent. Um, so we are going to now kick it off to our amazing DJ who will close us out for this day today. But again, I wanna thank you all for joining us. Thank you to the entire Walker's Legacy team for a phenomenal summit. And we look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you so much. DJ, kick it off. <laughs>